Well, welcome to the two people who are joining us. Hopefully we'll pick up a few extra people as we get going, but one way or the other, this recording will be here so that everyone can go and review it at their leisure and get some help with the last portions of the shawl. I will say that there is some interesting stuff in there that will give you a little bit of perspective on things like short rows and so on. So definitely worth having as a record for anybody who gets to this part of the shawl. So welcome everyone to the third and final Zoom for our or Greenlander Shawl Cal. It has been a real pleasure to be working through this shawl with everybody and to chat the history of it because that has been a lot of fun for me. I, in my misspent youth, had gained myself an archaeology degree and had always wanted to be an archaeologist. Didn't quite work out that way, but that's okay because I've been able to put that interest into my design work. So welcome to additional people joining. You are welcome to turn your cameras on and um, if you want to be available. Uh, right now, we'll probably stay muted, but because we're a nice small group, if you have questions at any point, feel free to turn your microphones on and just you know jump in. Or you're always welcome to put questions in the chat and my wonderful companion, Wendy here, will help you with uh, reading those questions out to me or anything else that you need, like links or what have you. I don't think we have any links that We'll have to put in, but you never know where this will go. So I thought I would just start this uh, Zoom off with um, a reminder to everybody who is viewing it in regular time that you've got one more week to post your shawls on any sort of social media. I think it's one more week. Wendy will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so that you can be eligible for the grand prize for the Cal. I do love giving away prizes. I quite enjoy that sort of thing. And I really feel that if somebody's going to put the effort in to be chatting back and forth, that having a little treat to be eligible for is always enjoyable. So if you're watching this after the Cal has ended, well, the next one you join with us, make sure that you do post because then we know you're part of it and you'll be eligible for prizes there. So, we pick up with our shawl on the final two sections. One of them is called Leaving Greenland, and then the other one is Sales of Change. And there are two different wings on there, and that's because this old shawl shape is a triangle that builds out wings to the side. And the idea behind it was so that you would be able to take those wings if you wanted and tie them in various knots. So the shawl has a lot of different ways that you can style it or you could cross them over your chest and tie them behind your back and then it worked very much like a jacket, except you didn't have anything encumbering your arms. Now, I will tell you that I did try this out in the mountains when we were doing the second photo shoot for this particular shawl and I was amazed at what an effective shape it is to keep you warm and cozy. I was actually warmer with that than I was later on when I put a coat on. So kind of an interesting thing that this old, old shawl shape is so incredibly effective at keeping one warm. Making the wings involves, if you're following precisely the old recipe, very long tails. And I thought, given the modern constraints of what we're doing with our shawls and the fact that we like to style them in more than one way, that I would actually short row those wings to shorten them up a little bit. So they are long enough on the current version that you can cross them over and tie them, but they're not long enough to bring them back around to the front the way that you might have with one of the old shawls. So you could cross them behind your back, bring them back around you, tie a knot and so on with the old style. This just allows you to tie it behind your back, which is still very cozy and lovely, but they aren't going to drag down by your feet, especially if you're not a six foot tall knitter. So the short rows on those are not that difficult to work, but I'm going to demonstrate them because they're a little bit weird in that there is nothing to do when you turn the row on the short row. So with a lot of them, for example, you might do a wrap and turn or you might do a German short row where you're pulling the stitch over the needle. And due to the way that this one works, you can't do any of those. So what I've done is when we go and we knit the full row once we've done both wings, we end up closing the gap by making the equivalent of a short row stitch at that time. So it works just the same as a regular short row, but it's actually a lot easier to work while you're doing the wings themselves, because all you got to do is turn the work and keep on going. There's no weirdness. There's no struggling to pull stitches over and hold them in place. There's no having to pick up wraps later on, none of that sort of stuff. So it's a nifty way to work a short row, and it works in exactly the same way in that what a short row is meant to do is tighten up the stitch so that it's not so floppy and visible that you've made a turn. That's really honestly what a short row and the handling of it at the turn is meant to do. So this will act in the same way, but be a little bit less fraught. 
I did experiment with a lot of different ways to do them. And I finally decided this made more sense because quite frankly, it was just a pain to do it in any other fashion. So before we get into the swatches and the showing of various things, let's conclude with the various different bits of history that we have. So the shawl was inspired by the Greenlander saga, and there's actually several Norse sagas, including the saga of Eric the Red. And the one that I used was the Greenlander one. So there's one part we haven't talked about yet, and that's what happens as the settlements in Greenland go through the centuries do people stay there? Do they leave? How do they finally disappear? We talked a little bit last time about some of what the various different archaeological assumptions are in terms of why people would have left, but we'll cover that a little bit again today and then talk about what else is in the saga itself. So the Greenlander saga not only tells the story of Eric the Red and how he ends up founding the settlements in Greenland, but it also tells the story of six other people who set out to um, run expeditions to what would later be known as North America. So the people who actually found North America from Europe, the first people to go there. Christopher Columbus, sorry, you've been knocked off of your pedestal for a long time. And it's actually the Vikings who got there first to meet the indigenous peoples there. So the saga, saga of the Greenlanders in total, it talks about the conflict between Christianity and the Old Norse religion. It talks about how women are actually important in this society. So not all societies in you know the 1000s actually held women in esteem, but this one did and women have a lot of agency in it. And you see this in the sagas. And as we talk about the six different voyages to the new world, you're going to see some of that in terms of what happens. One of the things that's really interesting about this particular saga is that it really gives you a good perspective on the personalities of people. So these people lived a thousand years ago, but you really start to feel like you got to know them through reading the saga. So during the saga's time, we have six different expeditions that either catch sight of or go to North America. The first one is somebody called Bjarni. And there's lots of different ways to pronounce this, and I'm going with the one that somebody told me, but I'm sure that there's much more accurate versions. We're just going to give me a buy on this because this is just the one that I am using by a friend who uses the name. Anyway, he is believed to be the first European who had a voyage that actually sighted North America. So he and his crew got blown off course when they were actually heading out looking for new lands. They would have seen Greenland and they were the ones that told Eric about it and so he set off on his expeditions but they also cited that he saw something else. So one year before he went to the Iceland to visit his parents he realized that his parents weren't there they had gone to Greenland so he set off to follow his dad and go to Greenland but he got blown off course. So what happened? Well, he saw this land and it didn't look like anything he'd seen before. It was covered with trees and mountains. And he was like, nope, got to get to see to my dad. So even though his crew was begging him to, he didn't stop there. He actually saw th three different pieces of land. And so again, he reported another piece of land that had low lying hills covered with forests and one that had some ice and snow. Didn't stop in any of them. His crew was probably pretty annoyed, but they did manage to get back to Greenland. He got his visit with his dad and all was well. So he didn't keep this to himself. He told people about it. Eric the Red knew about it. Sorry, he got back to Iceland and met with his dad and stuff like that. Anyway, he told a fellow named Leif about it. And Leif got really intrigued by this. And he said, hey, can I buy your ship? And so Bjarni said, sure, why not? So he sold him his ship. Leif hires a crew of 35 people. And then he asks Eric to actually lead the voyage. And Eric is a little dubious about this. He's getting a little bit older. He's settled. He's kind of happy where he is. He doesn't really want to go. But finally, he says, all right, fine. Gets on his horse to ride to the ship. And his horse stumbles and he falls off. And he says, that's it. My foot hurts. I'm not going. This is a sign from above that this is just a bad idea. And he bows out of the expedition. So he says, I'm not meant to discover more lands. It's on you, Leaf. Have fun. So Leaf sets off and he and his crew find the same lands that Bjarni did, but they find them in the reverse order. So first they come across an icy land and when they go ashore, they find it not terribly interesting. So the thought here is that they had gone rather north and found some of the various different islands um, that you might find there that are much more challenging in terms of climate. So he and his crew leave pretty darn quickly and they head off he did give it a name, Heluland, 
And that means stone slab land. Then they keep on sailing. And this time they find a forested land with white shores. And Leaf names this one Markland, meaning, meaning woodland, and again sets sail. Because again, it's a forest, whoop de doo Nothing terribly interesting if you're a Viking going looking for a place that you might want to settle. So he sails for two more days and comes across a new land, which appears a lot more inviting, and they decide to stay there for the winter. This one they thought was perfect. It was so good that you wouldn't need to feed your cattle in winter because there wasn't any frost and there wasn't a lot of dying off of the grasses and things like that. It was interesting to them too because day and night were a lot more equal than in Greenland or Iceland. So they were like, this is a really great place to stay. As they explored this land, they discovered grapes, and some of their crew got pretty darn excited about this because, woohoo, wine, and so Leif actually names it Vinland, meaning wine land. In the spring, they set sail back to Greenland with a ship loaded with wood and grapes, and during this voyage home, they come across and rescue a group of shipwrecked Norsemen. After this, Leif gets called Leif the Lucky. So it was a good expedition for him. He found a really intriguing place, and of course, being Vikings, they shared all of this information. So later, his brother Torvald thinks, ooh, that has not been explored enough. I'm going to head out. So what does he do? He gets the same ship from his brother Leif, cruise it, and they set sail this time with a crew of 30. They get to Vinland, where Leif has previously made camp, and they stay there for the winter and survive by fishing. This is something that would not have been alien to Vikings because if they had been living in Greenland, this was a big part of their subsistence there. So they would have had farm animals, they would have been raising crops, but they were also living off of a lot of marine catches, including seals, fish, and so on. So this was something that made a lot of sense to them. Once the spring comes, Torvald goes exploring and sails off to the west, and he doesn't find a lot of signs of human habitation except for one corn shed, apparently. So they return to their camp for the winter, stay over the winter again, and then the next year, the second year now, Torvald makes another exploration off to the east and north from their camp, and they find a pleasant forested area. Torvald says, ooh, this is a really nice and pretty place, and I would love to set up some dwellings here. They have sand beaches, and then something comes up that they haven't seen before, and that's three canoes with three men in each. So, this is a little bit disturbing to Thorvald, and being a Viking, what he decides to do is attack them, and they kill everyone except one person who gets away with his canoe. They saw something that looked like habitations, and they were like, oh boy, and they were right, because the natives, who these Vikings named Skraelings, return with a larger force and attack Thorvald and his men. They fire missiles at them, i.e. arrows. And Torvald receives a fatal wound in the battle and ends up buried in Vinland. His crew say, enough is enough, and they go back to Greenland. So the story is told yet again, and another person decides that this would be an interesting place to go. I'm going to give it a try. And so someone called Thorstein, or Thorstein, depending on how you pronounce it, and his wife Gudrid decide to travel to Vinland for the body of his brother. So this is really a very sort of family-oriented series of voyages. So he doesn't like the idea that his brother's bones are left in foreign soil, and he's like, I'm going to go get my brother, and I'm going to bring him home and give him a proper burial. So yet again, the same ship is prepared, and he sets bleh, he sets sail with a crew this time of 25 plus his wife, Gudrid. The expedition never actually reaches Vinland, and they sail the entire summer and finally end up on the coast of Greenland. So he's not successful in retrieving his brother's body. And unfortunately for him, in the winter he falls ill and dies. But he does speak of the fortunes of his wife, Gudrid, and says that she will find another love and continue to adventure on. And he proves to be correct because a ship commanded by a man named Thorfinn or Torfinn, Carl Sefni, who is a rich man, arrives in Greenland. He stays with Leif over the winter and falls in love with Gudrid, who is now a widow. They marry later that same winter, and then he's encouraged by his wife and other people who have heard the various stories and seen the grapes and the wood and everything to lead another expedition to Vinland. He agrees to go, and he hires a crew of 60 men and five women. The expedition arrives in Leif and Thorvald's old camp and stays there for the winter, and it's pretty good good conditions. They think this is pretty nice. The next summer, a group of Skraelings come to visit. They have skins for trade. They want weapons in return. But Carl Sefni says, nope, nope, we're not trading weapons. That's a stupid thing to do. Instead, he offers them dairy products. And this first trade is successful. Near the beginning of the second winter that they spend there, 
the Skraelings come again to trade, and this time, when one of them reaches for one of the Vikings' weapons, one of the Vikings kills a Skraeling. This is not good. They run off, and Karlsefni, fearing that they will return hostile in and in larger numbers, prepares for battle. They do indeed come again, and the Vikings manage to fight them off. Karl Sefni stays there for the rest of the winter and then returns to Greenland the following spring. They also have a child during that time, which is kind of interesting. So the final expedition is made by Freydis, Eric's daughter. She is the daughter of Eric the Red, and she is a feisty sort. So she proposes a voyage to Vinland with two brothers named Helgi and Finbogi, and she offers to share the profits of the expedition 50-50. She's not terribly nice, this gal, and she's a little bit sneaky. So they set off with the brothers having agreed, and they get to the camp. And before they get to this camp in Vinland, she has talked to Leif, her brother, and said, can I have your houses and use them? And he's like, all right, fine, I guess you can. You're, you know, related to me, and okay, you can use them, but you can't keep them. You can only borrow them. The agreement between Freydis and the brothers is that each party can have no more than 30 men on board and women as well. And this agreement is meant to ensure that everybody has an equal chance at the resources and the things that they're going to be bringing back and they'll get an equal chance at profits. But Freydis is a sneaky sort. And in addition to say, arranging in advance that she will have comfortable houses, she also brings five extra men. So they settle there, they spend the winter, the brothers initially try to get into the houses, she says, oh heck no, those are mine, get out you bad guys, and so they have to make their own houses so they don't have quite as good a winter. There's bickering between them during the winter, a series of small disputes, and finally one day she decides to have them out with the brothers. The only one who's awake at that point is Finbogi, and he steps out to hear what they have to say, and she proposes that they trade ships because the brother's ships are a little bit bigger and she wants to take her loot and leave and she'll leave the whole thing to them. Well, they agree, and so she takes ship and heads off. Unfortunately for them, that doesn't necessarily work out so well because when Freydis gets back, she wakes her husband up by sticking her cold feet under the blankets with him and then tells him that the brothers have been awful to her and they were so mean and they were so bad and they struck her and her husband gets really, really mad about this and says, well, that does it. And so they get back into the ships after she has threatened to divorce him if he does not defend her honor, and they go back to Vinland, and it does not go well for the poor brothers. So Torvald takes his men and ties up all the men from the other camp in a sneak attack while they're sleeping, and then Freydis has every man killed on the spot if they belong to the original two brothers' crews. Soon only the five women are left alive, but no man dares to kill them, so Freydis shows her true colors and says, give me an axe, and she does herself. So she's very pleased with the whole thing. She's happy about everything and how it's gone. And what they do is they concoct a story saying that the brothers had decided to stay there, take all of their stuff, and they head back to Greenland. So once they're back to the Greenland, they go back to the farm. Freydis ensures that her crew is well rewarded to keep their mouths shut about her dastardly deeds, but eventually Leif does find out about it. He is furious and he predicts that their descendants will not get on well in this world. So it's quite the story of these expeditions to North America. And it is definitely part of leaving Greenland in the shawl because what I've done is I have created a motif that is a combination of Celtics, or not Celtic, Nordic snowflakes and that traditional motif that you see in the previous section and vines for Vinland because you have these people that came from a cold place and went to a warm place with vines and then you have this back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So that's why that section is there with that particular motif because I thought that would be really fun to indicate the six voyages and Vinland itself. So of course, Greenland was never a static settlement that wasn't in touch with other communities and so on, which meant that as things changed over the centuries, people were doing a lot of trading, they were going back and forth. And as we had discussed previously, there were definitely issues in terms of economy. So there was a lot of downturn in the economy for Greenland. There were fewer places where they could sell their products. There were fewer walruses to get ivory from. The climate was drying out and getting colder. And so in the end, people had dispersed. There were, of course, many expeditions to explore many more places just than Vinland and the New World. And this is part of where 
the archaeologists feel that some of the Greenland population went, and then some of them would have gone back to Iceland and the settlements there, and some of them would have also returned to Norway. So eventually, those settlements were abandoned. The indigenous peoples living there, not the same thing. They stayed all along, and they were there through the occupations of the Vikings and definitely did some trade with them. So the last two parts of the shawl are meant to indicate this parting of the ways, this heading off in different directions, and going back to some of the places where they had the deep dark fjords and the ice in the sky, and reflecting its stars into those deep dark waters. So that's the remainder of the story there. The border is the same color as the settlement portion of the shawl because it just made me think about going back to these settlements and continuing to prosper as you moved on in life. So that's how the whole story of the Greenlander saga ties into the shawl itself. And I hope you enjoyed that. It was a lot of fun for me to put all of those stories in there. And I guess Freda snuck into the shawl in terms of a few little sneaky tricks that I used in order to make things easier for me. And that would be things like the short rows. So Freitas is there in terms of, you know, I didn't follow the rules and I definitely was a little bit naughty in creating my version of short rowing up those wings. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do now is show you some examples of how we work each of the wings and how those short rows are going to work. And then I'm going to show you how we close the gap as it's known when you knit the row after you've done all the short rows. The other thing that I'll do is show you how to do the I chord because I didn't actually, and this kind of surprised me, I didn't actually put the I chord in the instructions of the pattern. Super easy to Google it, but it's also really nice to have me show you the version that I use for this I chord bind off. I do want to point out, we've sent out an update, but in case you haven't reprinted your pattern, in the Leaving Greenland section, between rows 11 and 12, a line was accidentally deleted in the layout of the pattern, and it said that you want to change to color one. So the last three rows of Leaving Greenland should be knit in your dark color, the dark color that you're going to be using in your wings. So it's C1, and depending on what colors you've selected, that might be either the navy blue or something different. So that was what the update was. It wasn't a significant update, but I do want to make sure if you didn't print it, that's all it is, but it's super important because it sets you up for going back to that mosaic, which goes up the wings, and you want to definitely be starting off with the three rows of the dark color so that you can begin the wing, which starts off with the mosaic stitch. So I'm now going to spotlight the camera that I will use here to give you some demonstrations. And this will allow me to show you how we actually work these. Now, the instructions here will give you some information. One of the things when you're working the wings on your shawl, and we're talking about these big pieces at the top. So you can see this dark blue section, and we're going to work the left and the right, and we're going to do each one on its own. Move you ball of yarn, you're in my way. It's much easier to do this if you take the stitches because we're going to begin with the right wing and move the left wing stitches onto some waist yarn. That way you don't have to deal with them hanging off of your needle and being really heavy. And if you put them on waist yarn, it's easy to put them back on the needle when we go, pardon me, to knit those. So putting them on waist yarn is in the pattern and I definitely recommend it. And it says each sail begins with 140 stitches, and then there are six stitches between the two sails, which are not worked during the creation of the sails. So those three rows will definitely be there, but we're not going to be doing any white in there. Now you'll see here there's a teeny bit of white, and that's actually peeking through because what I did was I carried it across the back when I got to my other wing here. And it might be my woven in then too. So we're going to start with the right sail. We have theoretically transferred our stitches to waist yarn. And what I have is just a big swatch here that we're going to use to work this. So I've used the reverse colors on my swatch for you just so that it's easier to see on the zoom itself. This would be your dark color. In my case, it's a light color and I will make the mosaic rose with a dark color so that you can see it more easily. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with our contrast color, which would be C2. And it begins by saying, slip one with yarn and back, knit back and front, slip one with yarn and back, and then you're going to do some repeating. So we slip our stitch with the yarn in the back, and then we're going to knit front and back. The way that I tend to join yarn is I just start knitting with it. And what I will do is flip the end over itself. Stop that you springy stuff. 
knit my stitch, go to the next stitch, flip the end over the working yarn again, and that's going to keep it from making a really big loose blob that will drive me crazy. So that's just a nice little thing that you can do for yourself to anchor it there. You could also tie it in. You could weave the end in and start with it there. It's There's lots of different ways to join, but that's just my little trick that I use all the time. So now we've done our knit front and back. We're going to slip one with yarn in back, and then we're going to start off on the pattern. Knit one, slip three with yarn in back, which is our mosaic, until we get to the marker. So we knit one, slip our three, and we've gotten our hands used to only having to slip one in the star section. So remember to spread your stitches when you're slipping three. And you want the yarn on the back to look like a little bit of a smile. You want a little bit of a loop so that you have enough ease there that you can stretch that yarn out easily. So we're just going to knit here, repeating our knit one, slip three, until we get to one stitch away from the marker. And you can see that I just stretch them out as I go, and that's going to give me my little smile. It's very exciting watching somebody else knit, I'm sure. Getting close, and I did do a nice long swatch here just because then we could repeat a few rows and a few stitches. So now I've gotten to the one stitch before the marker, and what we're going to do is knit that stitch. Now we're going to remove the marker because the marker is going to mark where we turn each time. So we take the marker out and set it down, turn the work, and then row two says we're going to slip four with yarn in front and then place the marker. So this will feel a bit weird and a bit odd. Go with it. You're going to make a nice long loop. I tend to put the yarn on the other side of the work then put my stitch marker on. There is no good reason for that. It just makes me happy. And then we're going to knit the dark stitches and slip the other ones with the yarn in front. So we're knitting the dark stitches because those are your contrast mosaic and they are done in garter, whereas the background is done in stocking. So it's just like the very start of the shawl at the very bottom point. And you can see that my yarn is making nice, happy little smiles. If your stitches get really big at this point, don't worry about them. Like if they pull a little bit, as long as you initially space them properly, when you go to block them, it'll turn out just fine. It'll stretch back into place. And then this yarn likes to get a little fuzzy and it sticks to itself. So they are just gonna lie nice and flat against your work later on. Okay, when we get to the end of the row here, our instructions are to repeat this until the last five stitches, and then we're going to knit one, slip one with yarn in front, and purl three. So I'm at my last five stitches, so I'm going to knit one. I'm going to slip one, and then I'm going to purl three. See, that got a little bit big, but not too loose, and I can tug on my tail a little bit to tighten those edge stitches up. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use the next color and the next four rows are much easier. I've left this one on the front of the work, so I'm going to slip it and bring the yarn to the back of the work. If you had the yarn broken and you did had to attach it, you would do exactly what I'd done on the previous row and so on. We definitely don't want that yarn to cross around the outside because then it makes a bump on the edge that you will see later on because nothing else has a bump. Now we do our knit back and front. And then the instructions say we knit to the marker, remove the marker and turn. So you're gonna to have to watch some knitting here as I get my way down to the other end. But I want to do this turn for you a couple of times at least so that you get a good feel for how it goes. And if you've never watched me knit before and you're curious about what I'm doing, this is a style of knitting called flick knitting. I'm trying not to go too fast because that way you can see what I'm doing and how I'm tensioning everything. Now, I did do the border on this in garter just so that it didn't roll up in the video. And here we are at our marker. So I knit my last stitch, remove the marker, turn the work, and then the next row says slip one with yarn in front. So we're going to slip this stitch, and then it says to purl three, place marker, and then purl to the end. So each time that we turn the work, we're removing four stitches from the work. So we're short rowing every four stitches here. 
So we put our marker back on and then we purl back. And you can see that I have my little smiles for my slips on my mosaic. Technically, the entire thing is mosaic, but it's kind of nice to see those being smiles. Now, the other thing is notice that the bottom one is going to sit lower and it's not going to look like it's going to look longer than the one above it. Don't worry about that. That's totally normal. And they actually have the same length of yarn, but some of it is in between the stitches right now. So it's going to be perfectly normal if your two lengths of yarn are not the same and they sit one above the other. So we're getting to the end of the row. Now, a little review on carrying our yarn up the side. There's no way that we wanna be constantly breaking this yarn and weaving the ends in because this way lies madness, as my mother would have said. So what we're going to do is catch that dark yarn so that it's tucked up against the edge by bringing the other yarn that we are going to do the next two rows up from underneath it and just go on ahead and see how that's going to catch that dark yarn in there. That's just gonna tuck it up against the edge of the shawl so you don't have a big long carry that's showing. You wouldn't have to do that and it would still be fine, but it would be annoying to look at. And I like to do that little trick because it keeps it in place. So on this row, we're going to do the exact same thing. And I just give that a little tug to make sure I don't have a big loose loop. And we're going to knit all the way down after our knit front and back to our marker. And you'll already be able to see the taper forming when we get to this marker. If you don't use the marker, you would have to look for where you had slipped on the previous row and it would get kind of awkward. So it's something that I would strongly suggest continuing to work with because it just makes life so much easier. So I've got to my marker. I'm going to remove my marker. I'm going to turn my work. Slip the first stitch, purl three, put my marker back in place, and purl to the end of the row. So for the people who are here and watching, do we have any questions at this point? I'll show you what this looks like as soon as I've got back to the end of the row. And Wendy, you'll have to let me know if there's anything in the chat. I'm hoping that this is visible enough for everyone. It's very visible, but uh, no questions yet. You're explaining everything very clearly. Yay. And the picture is coming through very clearly. Well, that's great to hear. This is why I flipped my, my uh, yarn around because technically I should have a dark sail here, but I decided it would be a lot more visible if we went with the light. So at this point, when we would go to do our next dark row, we're going to pick the dark row up from underneath the gray and then continue on that way. And if you're worried about it being too tight, you can always just stretch your border out and make sure that you have enough slack in there for it not to pull tight, but usually it behaves itself quite well. And you can now see how this sail is forming this nice gradual taper. In reality, because you're adding a stitch on each right side row, and you're taking four away, what's really happening is the overall count is changing by three, but each time we're moving that stitch marker by four, because that gives us a reasonable length of wing. You could change this if you wanted, but I strongly recommend not to because you might run out of yarn if you do. So you'd need another ball of your dark color if you wanna change and make the wings longer. It certainly could be done. It would be no problem at all. You would just reduce the number of stitches that you move each time you get to the marker. So this is what it looks like doing the right wing. Um, you know what, I'll do one more of the dark and then what we will do is we'll switch to the left sail and talk about details there. So with this one again, we're going to slip the first stitch, knit back in front, and the pattern will give you the information that you're needing so they change because it's the same thing we wanna offset these dark dots. So now we are on row seven. So we slip one with yarn and back, knit front and back. Now we're going to slip two with yarn and back. And then we're going to knit one, slip three until we get uh, to the last three stitches before the marker. So we have knit our one after slipping two, slip three, two, three, 
two, three. It's worth doing this because sometimes your turns will be a little bit different when you get to them from what was there before. Oops, I got to my last three stitches and then did a thing. Okay, so we're at the last three stitches here. And what we do then is knit one, slip two with yarn and back. So we knit the one, we slip the two, we take the marker. Now here is a little bit different on the back because we don't have any yarn on those last two stitches. So we're just not gonna worry about that. We're just going to go ahead and slip them like we would on any other row. So in this case, we're going to slip two with our yarn in front. Then we're going to knit one. Then we're going to slip the next stitch. And here's where we'll put our marker back. So we've skipped the same four stitches. Sometimes you'll be working those that first stitch or two. Sometimes you, well, you'll be working the second stitch in. Sometimes you won't. So follow the pattern, trust in it. It'll all work out. It's not going to pull weirdly. It will behave itself. And we will close those gaps so that it doesn't look all weird and kinky later on. So that's why I wanted to do one more set of these was to show you that it, uh, it might feel a bit weird, but just follow the pattern. And the first stitch is always slipped. And then you will knit or slip depending on what comes up. And we're just following the pattern as we get back. When we get to the last five stitches, we slip two, and then we're going to purl the last three. So that's the right wing. And we're going to keep on doing this exact same thing until we are down to a small number of stitches. We could have gotten rid of all of them, but it actually made kind of a weird little point. So I didn't go all the way down to none. What we'll end up is eight stitches on the needle that never got short rowed. And that's where you're going to stop. Now, the left sail, the instructions for the left sail begin with telling you that you're going to twist the color not in use with the working yarn at each turn. So because the right side begins at, in the middle of your shawl, it's gonna be a bit weird because you're changing colors along the inside edge, not the outside edge. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like in the original, and it's gonna feel weird, but as long as you twist them whenever you change or whenever you get to that row again, there's gonna be no problems. So this is just the background of that first row that closed the gaps, and you can actually see a little jog where it closed a gap. And when we look at the left side, you see the streak along here? This is just where the yarns have been twisted and I'm carrying the one that I'm not working with. So you can see that it's lying nice and tight up against the shawl border that's never been snagged and this has been worn quite a bit. So you are just going to be carrying the yarn along here and you don't need to worry about it. So deep breath, it's not too weird. You're just going to twist each time you make the turn with the yarn that's not being used and that will just carry the yarn along the back of your work. So it's exactly like we were doing up the edges, just at an angle instead. So I did want to bring that to your attention and say deep breath, it's not so bad, and we are going to demonstrate that just now. So we have here a swatch that is going to be the equivalent of our left wing. Let's break the yarn here so I have a nice fresh working yarn. Pull some loose so we don't get tangled. So the left sail says join C2 at the first stitch marker from the left edge. Now, when you started, well, actually, when you did the last row of leaving Greenland, you would have placed two markers. So there's one left here in the middle of the shawl, and this is acting as that marker. So what we're going to do is join the yarn at that point. And again, you can either place the extra stitches on waste yarn. Most of them will actually be on your needle cord already anyway, or you can just leave them on the needle. However you want to handle this, it'll be an interesting thing for you to try. So we're going to join the yarn here and we're going to take this marker away because we are again starting our short rows. So we're going to knit one. And again, the way that I would join the yarn is I am going to flip the tail over and that'll just help to keep it in place when I make my first stitch. And you can come and later on weave that tail in. So we have removed the marker, we've knit one, we're going to slip three with yarn and back, one, two, three. Then we're going to place our marker. So just like before, we're marking the turn. And then from there, we're going to knit one and slip three with yarn and back until the last four stitches. And then we will work the edge. So knit one, slip three. Knit one, slip three. 
And again, just like I was doing before, my little way to make sure that my smiles are tight enough is I'll actually give it a little tug just as I finish that stitch. And I spread my stitches out regularly on the needle. So I'm at my last four stitches, and then it says knit one, slip one with yarn in back, knit front and back, knit one. All complicated to say, but actually pretty easy. And this is exactly mirroring what we did on this row on the right side. And then we're going to knit this last stitch. Now we will work back with row two. So we're going to slip one with the yarn in front, purl two, because our edges are always stocking on this portion. Then we're going to slip one with one yarn in front, and then we're going to go through and knit one, slip three with yarn in front until we get back to our marker. And you see how my smiles are definitely not all lining up. That is totally normal because you've got yarn going between the stitches that makes it look shorter. So once we get to our marker here, we are going to knit one, remove the marker and turn. Okay, so now what we're going to have to do is use C1. So we're going to be joining C1 here in this case. And again, making sure I'm actually under the camera. Don't know why I'm leaving such a long tail there. I just like to flip that over, knit my stitch. We're going to knit four. And our dark yarn is just going to be abandoned back here, sad and lonely. Whoops, I did something dumb. That's actually kind of handy. So what I wanted to do was to move the, the previous yarn to the back of the needle to make this easier to work with. Otherwise your yarn's sticking out the front and then you're going to have a problem later on. So it's a good thing I did that because it was I was able to mention that you got to make sure to move that to the back of the work. Okay, now we can knit our four and place our marker. And this little blob here just drives me nuts, so I just wanted to tighten that up. There we go. Okay, placing the marker. And then what row three continues to say is that we are going to... Oh, I didn't slip the first stitch. I'm a bad girl. Okay, it's a good thing that I'm making a lot of boo-boos here because this way you can see the kinds of things that you have to watch for yourself. So I will just tink back. Whenever possible, we always with these want to slip the first stitch because then that helps to tighten up the yarn there. So we slip this first stitch, join on the second stitch. One more time with feeling. Okay, now we'll knit the three and place our marker. And something, by the way, that I always do is I always go back and read the instructions twice, and it's a good thing, isn't it? So once we've placed our marker, we knit to the last two stitches, knit front and back, knit one. So we're going to just keep on going. And you'll notice that as I go, it's going to start forming stocking stitch. And again, I just made a garter border for the swatch to keep it from from being all rolly. And again, knit back front. And just a reminder, it's back front, not front back. And the reason for that is, is it just gives you a little nicer rounded edge than a normal front back. Okay. Row four with C1, we're slip one with yarn in front, purl to marker, remove marker, and turn. So we're just doing stocking stitch here. At the turn is where we're going to catch the previous color. So that would be the dark one. And I know for those of us who have not done a lot of this catching color and stuff, this is going to be a little nerve wracking, but trust me, it's no different than pulling the strands like you did for the slipping. It's going to feel exactly the same. Okay, so we're going to remove our marker. We're going to turn. 
And at this point, this is where I'm going to catch my dark yarn that I want to tuck up against this edge. So I'm going to take my yarn to the back. I'm going to bring it underneath the dark yarn and then just start working. Sorry, I just got to get some yarn loose here. So we've brought it up underneath from to the right, the dark yarn. And then we're going to slip the first stitch and we're going to knit the next one. And here you can just give it a gentle tug and there's your carried yarn on the edge. So this will tuck right up against the I-cord edge later on and you won't notice it unless you go looking for it. So we're going to knit two more, place our marker, and then we're going to head off to the end of the row. So are there any questions on that? I'll do this one more time so that you can see the turn and catching the yarn. No questions in the chat yet. So everybody yeah. must be following along perfectly. <laughs> well, it seems a lot more disturbing than it actually is when you get going and do it. So you just have to remember to bring the yarn up under the previous yarn every time you turn on the left wing and then all will be well. If you forget, it's not such a big deal. You can still carry it along if you want, or if you're really worried because it's a very long carry, then break the yarn, weave the end in and just join again. So there is no giant disaster should something untoward happen. So I am now slipped the one in yarn in front and purling back to the marker. And this is where we will make a change of color again. So I am just finishing row six here. Okay, remove our marker. And now on row seven, we're going to use C2 again, which is our dark color. So again, what we wanna do is twist them. And in this case, we're going to make a little bit of a loop-de-loop -loop to make sure that we've twisted them well, because this one is sitting further back. And if we just bring it up underneath, it just crosses and it isn't twisted. So I'm just going to twist by wrapping it around the gray yarn once. And it's a little bit of strand management for a moment, but see how it catches there? So that just helps to tuck that yarn up. Slip one. And let's read the row here. So we're going to slip one with yarn in back. We're going to knit one. Then what we're going to do is, sorry, slip two with yarn in back. See, it always pays off to read the pattern twice. Slip two knit one, slip one, place marker. So this is all following what the pattern says. And what this is doing is making sure that our little dots are offset from each other so they look very much like nice little stars in the sky. Now, after we've placed our marker, we're going to slip two with yarn and back. Then we're going to knit one, slip three, until we get to the last five stitches. So you can see this chews up yarn really fast or choose up stitches really fast. So the wings feel like they're super long, but they're actually not. So we have gotten to our last five stitches. We knit one, slip two with yarn and back, and then we're going to do our knit back in front and knit one. And now you can see the taper is forming on the left wing just the way it had been on the right. So, Let's look at how we close the gaps because that's the last piece and it's quite an important one. As you can see, the wings are nowhere near as scary as they felt. And I have an itty bitty little set of wings here on this needle. And this is where, you know, not having gartered all the way up was kind of annoying because it's wanting to roll on me a tiny bit, but I have an itty bitty right wing and an itty bitty left wing. So when we get to the point where we are going to close the gap, we're going to join a new yarn. So you'll notice that all the old yarns are disconnected here. We're going to knit one row where we join the gaps every four stitches as we go. And I have given you different instructions for the right wing and the left wing. So we're going to join the yarn and knit a right side row. This is going to do two things. It's going to join the gaps and it's going to mean that when you work your I-cord bind off that you don't have any little bits of color showing on the right side of the shawl. So, that nice little knit row just gives you that little bit of color on the edge that gives you a nice clean border there. But it also will pull this up into a nice smooth row for when you do the I-cord bind off. 
Okay, let's get our yarn. I decided to use my pretty purple. Give the camera a whack. Okay, so to close the gap on the right sail, we pick up the bar between the next stitch and the stitch just worked when we come to a gap. So we have to find our first gap and they're really easy to identify. First of all, you know that you're going to have eight stitches left that haven't been worked. This swatch is a little bit different because I just randomly chose a number of stitches. So for me, there's a gap here and you can see each gap on the needle when you spread the stitches, like they literally are a gap. So you see the gaps there and that's what we're closing each time that we go. So there'll be four stitches apart each gap and they do show up really, really well. But if you can't find them, as long as you've identified your first one, every fourth, every four, there'll be a gap. So what we're going to do is join our yarn. We slip. We're still going to continue the shaping of the shawl one last time. Although if you didn't, there's no tragedy. So we're going to come to our first gap. So now it says, pick up the bar between the next stitch and the stitch just worked. So we're at the gap. Here's our gap. Pick up the bar between the stitches going from front to back and place it on the left-hand needle. There it is. See that, how I've picked up the bar between the needles going from front to back and it's on the left-hand needle. Now what we're going to do is knit that bar and the next stitch together. That's all we have to do. If you pull it really tight, then it might get a little hard to get the needle tip in there, but you can do a little bit of wiggling. All right, now we're going to knit to the next gap. Now my first one was a little bit weird because I did something strange, but don't worry about that. We have the next gap. Grab the bar with the needle from front to back, leave it on the left, knit those two together. Now, do you see how it's closing those up? It's a nifty, nifty thing. So it's exactly as if you'd done a proper short row, but you didn't have to do all that fiddling at the time that you were doing the wings. Here we have a carried yarn. So what do we do? Pick up the stitch that between the, the last stitch there and the one on the needle. If you pick up the black yarn, it's not necessarily wrong, but it won't tighten it up as well as it could have. So I usually pick up in the main background color if I do something like this, where I've got a bar and the slip stitch is there. So I just go down one row and then that gives you a nice tight close. So we're going to have another one on the next one. And again, pick up the bar and knit that together. And sometimes if they sneak up like that on you, just push them back down the needle and then you'll be able to get your needle tip in there. Then we get to the center stitches and we're going to just knit those six. And now we come to closing the gaps on the left side. So to close the gap on the left side, we're going to slip the next stitch purlwise to the right hand needle, pick up the bar between this stitch and the next stitch, again going from front to back and place it on the left hand needle. So there's our bar. And again, use the main yarn, not the other one. Place this stitch back on the needle on the left. And now we're going to knit the bar and that stitch together. So we will come to the next gap. And again, you can really feel the gaps, they're noticeable. We're going to slip the first stitch to the right hand needle pick up the bar from front to back again, place the stitch on the left hand needle and knit those two together. Now it can get a little bit interesting in this instance where we have one of these slip stitches below, but just keep on fiddling with it. And if you have to push it further down the needle, a little bit of tugging like this, and then you will have no trouble getting your needle through there and knitting those two together. There we are, you little rascals. One, two, slip the next stitch to the right hand needle, pick up the bar. And the reason why this is tight is because this is exactly what we're trying to do is just tighten up the entire row in general, which is what a short row is doing with its various different ways of working the stitches. And sometimes you might just have to work those stitches right on the tips of the needles if they're being a little cantankerous, but it's doing exactly what we did on the right, which is tightening up those stitches and giving us 
a better fabric. Now, if you were having a really huge time, uh, troublesome time with doing the bar in between the stitches when you've got a color carried, you can either pick it up from the back and just turn it on your needle, or I give you permission to pick up the bar that was this one. It will still basically work. It will still help tighten it a little bit and no one's gonna be able to find it later on anyway. We got one last one here. Slip the stitch to the right, pick up a bar. This was all knit in the dark color at this point. I, by the way, did short roll all the way to the end of this particular side. I don't quite know why I did that, but that's all right, we'll close the rows. Oops, drop my bar. See, this is why I didn't want to use dark yarn. Okay. So any questions about that? If not... I have, I have a question, Caroline. Yes. Is this method of short rowing, can you use that instead of the German short row anytime you want? Or would it only work in this case? I think you probably could because I did a lot of experimenting. Um, the goal was is to get the same effect of tightening up the yarn, which is what a German short row does. So when you pick up the bar and put it on the needle, it's exactly as if you'd pulled the stitch over the needle with a German short row. So it's a tiny bit different on this shawl because sometimes the stitches is, you know, is slipped and sometimes it's a different yarn and so on. But in the end, it behaves in closing the gap exactly like a German short row. So that's a really good question, Wendy. So yes, I have tried this and experimented with it and it would work like a German short row. And to be honest with some yarns that don't like to be pulled over the needle the way the German short row works, I would certainly do this. The trick is to make sure that you're picking up the bar on the correct side, depending on the direction you're going and the direction that it was short road, if that makes sense. So again, yeah. this shawl is a little bit weird because it's all done on a right side row. So you know how in some short rows, you're going back on the wrong side, some on the right side. So you just wanna make sure that you're picking the bar up in the right place. Okay, so we have now come to the end of the row and this is where we're going to do our I cord. And the instructions tell you to use a DPN in a size up. Now, the reason for the DPN and a size up is that just gives you a little bit of ease when you go to work your I cord. And if you want to use a regular needle, you could. It's just that you don't want your I cord to pull so very tight that it pulls in on the top of the shawl. There's another way of dealing with it. And what that would be is, is that instead of using a bigger needle, work with the normal one and about every eight to 10 stitches, throw an extra row of I cord in. I don't personally care for doing that. I would really rather just work with a larger size needle. So how do we do an I-cord bind off? This is nice and easy. What we're going to do is we're going to cast on three stitches and you can do this using a backwards loop cast on or you can use a knitted cast on and today I am in the mood for a knitted cast on. We just want to add three stitches for our I-cord itself. So I've added my three stitches. Theoretically. The next stitch step rather with this is, is that we're going to knit two. Then we're going to slip one purl wise, knit one, and this stitch is just pulled kind of loose because I cast on into it and pass the stitch over. You could also knit two together between the back loops. You can do whatever you want. This is the way that I tend to do them when I'm working back on a row like this. Pass the three stitches back to the left needle, knit two, slip one purl wise, knit the next stitch, pass the stitch over, then pass them back to the left. And as I keep working this, we're going to start to see a nice tube forming, which is our I cord. One of the tricks is to not let when you pass the stitches back you don't want to leave the yarn all floppy so you don't want to make a big loop there because what's happening is that when you pass the stitches back and knit the first one the tension of the yarn will pull this into a round pass stitch over so now we're starting to see the tube of our i cord forming and when we look on the right side it's a nice clean way of finishing. I'm going to do some more so that you can get a better view of it, but it's really simple to do I-cord. So we're just passing the stitches back. 
and you can just knit the last two together through the back loop. And I'm just going to do that for fun so you can see the difference in it. This is a nice DPN. I've never used these before. These are the Knitter's Pride Zing DPNs, and I think I'm going to have to collect some because they are very nice. Knit two, knit two together through the back loop. So there's lots of different ways to do I-cord, but I will usually either do the pass stitch over or the knit two through the back loop versions. Get a couple more rows here, and then I'll show you the back. Caroline, Kathy yes. has just asked if there is an I-cord cast on. There is. There are two different forms of I-cord cast on, and one will leave a set of cute little loops along the edge of the I-cord, and the other one does not. So here is your edge. And you can see between the two methods, there really isn't much of a difference in terms of the look. It's just whatever's easier for you to work. So I've done half of it with the... Um, slip one with yarn and back, knit one, pass stitch over, and then I've done these knitting through the back loops, and it's pretty much identical. The thing that I find is if I do the pass stitch over, if I'm being a little bit tight, I tend to have a little more slack in my eye cord so that it's a little bit more elastic, but it gives you a nice clean edge. And because we closed the gaps previously, it's nice and smooth in the taper. So that is the eye cord bind off. I would be happy to explain how I-cord cast-ons are done in another Zoom because it is actually a really fun way to work and I use them myself quite often because I love the I-cord smoothness and finish. So quite often if I'm knitting a shawl and it wasn't designed to have that and it was just a plain old cast-off, I'll throw on an I-cord bind-off because I like them. And it gives a really nice smooth solid edge. So that's why there is an I-cord on the top of this shawl is it just gives it a really strong supportive edge that's comfortable as well around your neck because it's nice and smooth. So there's a little elasticity because I used a bigger needle, but it's not floppy and going to stretch out too much. It'll keep the shawl in shape for years to come. And that's one of the things that I think is important. So if there aren't any other questions, what we should do is, Wendy, we should draw for our very last $50 gift certificate. And then I will wish everyone luck on finishing their shawls. I'm going to take the... Okay, so you have to give me a minute to do that while Absolutely. you're waiting for me. Why don't we have some show and tell? That would be fantastic. So if anybody would like to show their progress off, that would be lovely. Ah, okay. I am going to oh. spotlight Gail, who has a beautiful shawl. Look at that. If you want to unmute and uh, talk about it, Gail, you're very welcome. Okay, I'm not sure what to say. I wasn't <laughs> sure which color was C and which was D, but I picked because I wanted the pink in the snowflakes. I think you got it beautifully. And one of the joys of shawl knitting is that, you know, there's never, I tell my students, there's no, there's no knitting police. And so if you want to change the colors up in something, I think it's a great way to put some of your own personal touch into it. So, you know, I will often play with colors and I love what you did there. So I don't know if that's the way it was meant to be, but it is absolutely beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have a winner. All righty. We only have four guests. So I said to Dan, without telling him who was who, pick pick a number. He picked a number. And the fourth, or sorry, the third guest on my screen is Susan's iPad. So Susan, how would you like to show us who you are? You're our lucky winner. Well, I can unmute, <laughs> but I don't know how to, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> do I, I hit, oh, oh my God. Do I hit start video or no? Yes. Do I on the top of the... Yeah, it should work. Okay. Oh, I'm so excited. Thank you very much. I'm just going to run and get my sample. I was okay. very late starting because I was so intimidated. And I don't know how many um, YouTube videos I watched on mosaic knitting. I mean, and then I was overthinking, overthinking, overthinking. And so, um, yeah, so... Anyway, I have started. I'm just going to go get it. 
<laughs> One thing that I should mention, and I'll mention it to Susan when she comes back, is that uh, anytime anyone's struggling with something or worried about it, please do make sure to just contact me directly. I would be more than happy to help you. And Susan, looks like you're watching a video. Did you good? Because that's gorgeous. <laughs> well, it's absolutely watched, perfect. I can't tell you how many times I watched the K, um, the Cal, your Cal video one, how many times and over and over. So well, anyway, I'm, I'm excited now. And um, I've given myself a year to finish. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I don't know. It looks like everybody else um, is a more experienced knitter and quicker than oh, me. Oh, no, 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 no. There's actually somebody who started just two days ago, and it's only her third shawl. So you are in very good company. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether, you know, you've been doing shawls for 50 years or five days. It's all about the enjoyment of knitting. And it's about just one stitch at a time and how mindful that is. So and I have enjoyed it and I've thoroughly enjoyed your um videos. Uh you are so instructive and in from informative. I, I just think it's been fantastic. And I thank, well, thank you. you. And I thank you to Wendy too. <laughs> so Susan. Okay, now that's enough for me. I'm gonna get off. <laughs> I've put my email address in the chat. It's sales at ancientartsfiber.com. So if you just like to email me um, when I come back to work on Tuesday, I'll set up your gift certificate for you. Thank you so much, Wendy. You're very Thank welcome. you very much, Caroline. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And if anybody ever needs to contact me for any help on any of my designs, you're very welcome to email me at caroline at ancientartsfiber.com. If you forget the email address, just email through the website. I will always get those emails and I am more than happy to help. If it's something you really struggle with, I've been known to do some little teeny videos and things like that. So whatever we need, we'll make sure you get through it in fine style. And I look forward to seeing your progress. I, I just have one other question. Maybe I should have done this mm -hmm. on the chat, but um, are you going to do a, a lace um, YouTube video? As you said in a second, Cal, maybe? Like with the double yeah. or the long loops? The double that, loops. That one, one, yeah, I definitely want to do that one. I know I talked about it in the staycation shawl, Cal, as well, because when you get to the big tulip flower in staycation, it's the same issue with loops. So either I'll do a new one or what we'll do is cut that portion out and make it a separate video with a header so you know what it is. Because it's a really interesting thing. It's one of the things in knitting is that, for example, you can pair cast ons and cast offs. And you can pair different types of stitches as well in order to kind of get some more symmetry. So the ways of doing yarn overs and pairing them is something that quite intrigues me as well. And I remember when I first discovered it, I was like enchanted with a new toy. So I will make sure that we get something there that's separate so that it's shorter and you don't have to look through an hour of video to find it. Because the staycation one has lots of tips and tricks and I know it's in there, but where in that video it is, not entirely certain. <laughs> So great I, thing to remind us of. And uh, the amazing Wendy will poke me with a stick so I get it done. Okay. <laughs> yes, I made a note. I was just going to show what mine looks like. Ooh, I've okay. just, just started the snowflakes. And I'm doing, I think it's the ninth option of colors. All the purples and blues. I love it. I'm excited. But I'm a, I'm a slow knitter because I work full time. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. And, you know, it's something to you. I always say to people that say to me, I feel so bad because I'm a slow knitter. And I'm like, yeah, but the thing is, if you're a fast knitter, it's much more expensive because you have to buy more yarn. <laughs> It was the bane of my existence when I was uh, in my 20s because I was broke, completely broke. I was going to school and I had no yarn budget. So I got into Shetland lace knitting because the yarn was so much cheaper because you'd buy the same, you know, you'd spend, say, $20 on yarn, but it was lace weight. So you got a lot more hours out of that same $20. All right. Well, if everybody is good, then what I will do is thank you so much for joining us. Make sure again to post on any form of social media so that you're eligible for the grand prize. And we always do something like a nice big shawl kit, sweater kit, those sorts of things. So it's definitely worth it. And okay. I really appreciate everyone who joined this Cal. And if you come in later on, you're very welcome and very appreciated as well.
One more thing, says Wendy. Oh, oh. Um, let's run the cal until April 15th because we have yes, to postpone the third Zoom a week. So let's postpone the end date a week as well to I give everybody a, a chance. Idea. So the fifth. Yeah, so you have until that date, date to post something. Now, bear in mind, it doesn't have to be finished. I don't believe in making you finish a project to be eligible for an end Cal prize because I know all of us have lives. So as long as you just post, that is considered an entry. And if you post 10 times, that's 10 entries. So, you know, let's have fun with this and not make it too stressful. So if you have cast on three stitches and you post it and say it's my Cal, tree. <laughs> All right, so to April 15th, and we will declare our winners on that day. Thank okay. you, everyone. I wish you happy knitting, and we'll see you back for the next one. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.